Hey, what's up, YouTube? This is Sports Fan Network, and I'm Travis. And I'm Andrew. And today we're going to do a video for our Week 3 NFL recap. And in this video, we're going to be going over five things that we learned after Week 3. And starting us off, we'll start with the Sean McVay experiment in L.A. is working extremely well. Yeah, it all starts with his development of Jared Goff. Uh, McVay had the reputation coming in of being kind of a quarterback whisperer. We kind of saw what he did with Kirk Cousins at Washington. And he's doing the same thing with Jared Goff here. I mean, he looks like a completely different quarterback uh, from his rookie season where he looked like a guy that maybe didn't even belong in the league. So this year he's looking like a potential franchise quarterback for this Rams team that is so desperate to find that franchise guy. Um, he, he just looked completely different this year. He's a lot more comfortable in the pocket. Uh, it seems that the additions with the offensive line, the wide receivers, especially Sammy Watkins, that deep threat ability has really helped him out. And even Robert Woods, too, is kind of a under-the-radar signing. Um, it's really helped with Goss' development, and he looks to be progressing into that franchise guy, that number one pick, that guy that they thought they were getting when they drafted him. Yeah, this is starting to look like a brilliant move for the Rams, who got rid of Got rid of Jeff Fisher, Mr. 8-8, eight and eight, and Sean McVay came in and just breathed new life into this offense. Um, you know, we talked, he talked about the offensive line additions, and that's also helped out Todd Gurley, who has looked a lot more like his rookie year self than last year. We had a big sophomore slump. Todd Gurley and uh, Jared Goff can really look like guys that can lead this Rams offense. And uh, just talk about Gurley, he has such a bigger role in the passing game this year. He looks like a dual threat, you know, running the ball and catching the ball so far. Eight and eight with Jeff Fisher. I think you're giving him too much credit. It's more seven like seven and nine. nine. Seven, seven and nine. nine. He's Mr. Seven and nine. So <laughs> we'll go with that one. I think eight and eight's a little bit too much there. But, yeah, it's exciting for the Los Angeles Rams. I mean, you know, with a city like L.A. where it's not really necessarily a diehard sports town, it's more of an entertainment sports town, uh, having a quarterback and sling it up and down the field and exciting running back in Todd Gurley, uh, bowls well for this franchise going forward. But going, moving on to our second takeaway of the week, let's go to another California team uh, with the Oakland Raiders. Derek Carr and that offense did not look good. Um, they really had a really terrible week against Washington on Sunday night. Yeah, they looked really, really bad. And a lot of people thought you know, Oakland and their high, high-powered offense would just roll into the nation's capital and just really control this game. And and ended up being the Redskins' defense ended up stealing the show. They ended up holding Derek Carr to only 118 passing yards. He had one touchdown, but he also had two interceptions. And they were able to sack him four times. And they were really able to disrupt this offense. And credit to the Redskins' defense. No one really gave them a shot considering they're at home, and they played really well. Yeah, something interesting for Derek Carr this year, he has not completed a pass that has traveled 20 yards in the air this season so far. So it's a lot That's of underneath great. stuff. Yeah, it's, it's incredible when you look at the weapons that they yeah. have, Amari Cooper and Michael Crabtree, that are not yeah. really attempting to push the ball down the field, but that's kind of what they been doing this year. And he's not, he didn't really get a lot of help from his running game either. I mean, Beast Mode had six rushes for only 18 yards. Uh, Crabtree and Cooper as wide receivers had only two catches for 13 yards. I mean, it was just a really bad effort for the Raiders, but I think some credit does have to go to the Redskins there. They did play a very good game defensively. And uh, it seems like their offense is starting to get going. Uh, Josh Dodson, their uh, second-year wide receiver, first-round pick from last year, he had a really impressive touchdown catch uh, in that game. Yeah, they showed to the owner, and he just looked like he was saying, finally, like their first-round pick. He made a big play for them in a nationally televised game. That was awesome for them. And for Redskins fans, if they can get Josh Dodson going, that's going to help their offense be a lot more explosive. But moving on to the next match, the, last thing, the next thing we learned, from week three is that there's a lot of teams that were favorites going in that got upset. You know, Baltimore got embarrassed in London. You had Denver falling to the Bills, which is extremely surprising. But the one I want to talk about is that the Bears were able to upset the Steelers in overtime. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about this too. Bears fan here. I mean, heck yeah. yeah. Uh, for the Bears, it all started with the running game here. I mean, they have a two-headed monster, it seems like, right here with Jordan Howard and Tariq Cohen. Just going over Jordan Howard's stats, 23 carries, 138 yards, two touchdowns, including the game-winning touchdown in overtime. Um, and he's doing that with a sprained AC joint in his right shoulder. So he was toughing it out. He had to be pulled out of the game twice due to um, injury. And just and you could tell during the game that that shoulder was really bothering him throughout. And he toughed it out and really led this team to a victory. 
and Tariq Cohen, the kind of lightning to Jordan Howard's thunder, 12 carries for 78 yards. Uh, probably should have had more yards and a touchdown because he did not step out of bounds on that fourth on that overtime play. Are you going on the record? He, he did not step out of bounds. He did not step out of the bounds. That was, <laughs> that was one of the most entertaining runs I've ever seen. Um, this dude was just straight up electric. And, I mean, they counted for about 90%, I think, of the yards the Bears had in that game. Mike Lennon only threw for 101 yards. And a lot of those were check downs to Tariq Cohen and Jordan Howard. So they only had one catch from a wide receiver in this game for the Bears. I mean, just completely old school, like old fashioned football here, relying on that defense. Uh, they really yeah. shut down Ben Roethlisberger in that uh, Pittsburgh offense. Yeah, talk about old school football, running the clock, controlling, running the ball, controlling the clock, playing good defense. That's what the Bears have been playing this year. And in a game where it's all about the aerial attack, they're going back to the old roots. It's a lot of fun to watch. And man, watching Tariq Cohen play. He just looks like a video game player out there. He's making people miss and just miss badly. I mean, he looks like a Darren Sproles in his prime, and I think this kid's got a really bright future. Yeah, he's just exciting to watch, and he really complements Jordan Howard's skill set well, where you know, Jordan Howard's more of a one-cut power back, and Tariq Cohen can come out there and just really change it up with the defense, give them a new look. Well, let's talk about this defense for the Bears here. I mean, they held Le'Veon Bell to 61 yards rushing in this one. And they got the big bed three times, uh, sacking him three times. Even though they really only rushed three or four guys for most of the game, they didn't really blitz a lot in this game. Yeah, that defensive line really controlled the trenches up front. And really, you know, they're in the backfield a lot, getting to Le'Veon Bell. They didn't let him get going, which is key. You know, we talked about Steelers' offense, and it seems like they got all these elite dynamic players, but they all can't – like, they all have individual good games, but they all can't play one solid good game. But the Bears' defense, you know, going into this year, we thought they were going to be really good. And, you know, for the first two of the three games, they've looked really sharp. But there's one thing i got to talk about in this game. I know you're and this it. is probably going to be the fail of the year. Marcus Cooper, what the heck were you doing, man? I mean, the blocked kickoff just fell into his arms and just stopped running like 15 yards from the end zone. It just looked like he stopped on the one and lost the ball. Man, when I saw that, I, I could not believe it because I knew this was a close game and that that's a difference-making play. Once that happened, I thought there was no – I thought that was just going to kill the Bears, like losing those points. With, I didn't think they could win this game, but they ended up holding on. But, wow, what a fail. Yeah, the Bears would have lost that one. Um <laughs> Marcus Cooper would have been a really vilified figure in the Bears uh, in Chicago for a couple of weeks here. Um, yeah, that was obviously a dumb play. Um, lack of concentration for sure for Marcus Cooper. Um, I thought he did have a pretty good game in the secondary, though. He only allowed one catch on nine targets, which is pretty impressive since he had the, um, you know, the task to take an eye on Antonio Brown and uh, some of those other weapons they had for Pittsburgh. So other than that, really just god-awful play there. Play pretty solid, um, but yeah, yeah that, that was that was pretty bad. Yeah, I'd like to point out that like, you know. he could have like three interceptions, and all people are going to talk about is what are you doing on that play? So unfortunately, he could have had a great game. People still would have talked about it, but I wanted to move on to the next thing we learned, and that is that Cam Newton looks absolutely terrible against this really bad Saints defense. What were your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, Cam Newton, I just – he hasn't looked like the same guy since he's kind of got that shoulder injured last year. Even going back to last year before he got injured, I mean, he hasn't really looked like the same guy since his MVP year. It kind of makes me think that maybe that, you know, 10-game stretch where he was playing at MVP level last uh, – two years ago might have been a little bit of a fluke, maybe a little bit of an outlier for him. Uh, he just hasn't looked like that same type of guy. And going against a really bad Saints defense, maybe one of the worst defenses in the league right now, he had three interceptions. Um, just really wasn't good at all. Only had 167 yards passing. And meanwhile, Drew Brees, the other side, did Drew Brees things and just completely obliterated the uh, Panthers' defense. Yeah, man, the MVP year for Cam Newton looks like a distant memory right now. And even before the shoulder injury, he had accuracy issues. Yeah. Coming off this shoulder injury, I mean, this, this guy that looks like he hasn't thrown a football in like eight months, and he really hasn't. And for me, you know, going into this game, I predicted Cam Newton was going to have a great game. And he just – he left a lot more questions than I had going in. I have a lot more questions after this game, you know, 
like you said, three picks, 176 yards. This Panthers offense has not looked good this year, and that defense just got torn apart by Drew Brees. That was a bad game for the Panthers. Yeah, it doesn't really seem like they know what they're, you know, what they're really doing on offense here because they drafted Christian McCaffrey and, and uh, Samuel in the draft to kind of be these uh, underneath guys that Cam Newton can get the ball out to them quick so they can get a lot of easy yards um, and underneath kind of routes there. And, you know, that's really not Cam Newton's strength. His strength is uh, running the ball, throwing deep shots down the field off of play action. And, you know, it just hasn't worked so far, so they're going to have to figure that out. But I want to move on to our last uh, takeaway here. Uh, this is a big one. The Jets are officially not going to go 0-16 like both of us kind of thought going into the season as they uh, they beat the Dolphins at home here. Uh, I did not see this one coming, mean, that's for sure. The Jets won a game, and I think that's the last time I'm going to say it this year. Yeah. But I cannot believe that the Jets beat the Dolphins. You know, going into this game, me and you, we both questioned that Jets – Defensive line's efforts and their ability to dominate games, it really looked like they hurt us in this game because they were able to hold Jay Ajayi to 16 yards on 11 carries. And they really just – they mm -hmm. got in Jake Ollie's face. You know, they rushed. They, they just played really well. They dominated the game, basically. And the Dolphins' defense just looked terrible. Somehow they let Josh McCown pick them apart. He went 18 for 23, 249 yards and a touchdown and. The Jets won a football game. Just what? Yeah. It feels, feels weird to say that <laughs> and hear that. I mean, obviously, we don't see them winning too many more games. They have more wins now than the Giants do, who we all thought would be, would be pretty <laughs> decent. Um, so that's really surprising um, overall. But, yeah, on the Dolphins side here, obviously, it's kind of showing that if you can pressure Jay Cutler and take away that running game, that, you know, they're going to struggle offensively for Miami. Um, that's something they need to fix because – you know, we're talking about I thought Jay Culler was a good signing for them after Ryan Tannehill went down. And, you know, they really need – you know, he's coming off basically an entire offseason where he wasn't doing anything except, you know, he's basically just chilling and retired basically. Uh, they need that running game. They need help, that support for him to really have this be a successful year for them. And they just really looked subpar in this one, um, entirely a team effort in this one that were, just wasn't really up to uh, their standards, I think. Yeah, they re the offense really looks like an offense that the guy leading it has only been there for a month, which is what has happened. Jay Cutler hasn't been there that long, and watching the first two games, it really looks like they're going for a lot of checkdowns underneath routes. I'm kind of looking for them to open up the playbook more, kind of be more aggressive. Now, I think this would be a wake-up call for the Dolphins, a game that they definitely should have won, and a game, you know, for a team that's trying to make the playoffs, you got to win a game when it's given to you. You can't not focus on them and not like, oh, yeah, we're playing the Jets week this right. week. We don't have to really be too prepared. And they just they got blown up in their face, and I'm sure they're embarrassed about it. But, yeah, you know, th those were our takeaways after watching week three. Um, a new thing that we're going to start doing is for our previews, you know, we predict who, who we think is going to win the game. And we've been keeping track of our records. So, right now, Andrew's winning. He's at 31-13 and 13 for the first three weeks. This does not include the Thursday night games. We have not picked a winner or loser for any of those yet. Um, right now, I'm 25 and 19. This was a pretty bad week three for me. No. I only ended up predicting five of them right. But we're going to keep tallying up the score as, as the season goes on and see how our prediction record's going. And we'll see, you know, at the end of the season who ended up doing better. Yeah, I had seven wins in this week. It was a really rough week because, you know, there were a lot of upsets that happened this week, um, obviously. Uh, just a lot of unexpected that ha unexpected stuff that happened. Uh, week two is a pretty good week for me, though, my predictions. But, yeah, um, I'm really excited to kind of keep this going and see how we do here because, you know, we've been doing all these previews for all these teams going forward. We feel like we have a pretty good idea of which – how these teams are going to be going forward and how these games are going to go. And it's going to be fun to see how, uh, whether our predictions will be right. Yeah, well, thank you guys so much for watching this video. It was a lot of fun filming this. And, uh, you know – if you got the time, please leave a like, subscribe, and we're going to have lots more videos coming out soon, so stay tuned. Yep, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, give us your thoughts about week three in the comment section below.